What's up guys, I'm Kyle, and this is the question and answer episode of the Vervet Forest. There's a ton of questions, so I've actually put the times that certain questions are uh, answered in the description below so that you can just like see where the time is and see the correlating question and then if you want to you can just go up to the video and you can skip ahead to that question and just watch the certain questions that you want to watch because there's going to be a long video with lots of stuff talked about but it's lots of interesting things talked about so if you've ever wondered about stuff here this is the perfect way for you to uh, find out about it all right here we go So the first question is, uh, what is the Vervet Monkey Foundation? Uh, the Vervet Monkey Foundation is a non-profit rescue and rehabilitation center for vervet monkeys in South Africa. We're located in the Limpopo province, which is the poorest province of South Africa, um, near a small town called Zunin. The sanctuary provides care, rehabilitation, family life for vervet monkeys, which are considered a pest are a vermin in South Africa by most of the locals. The Vervet Monkey Foundation has been around for almost 30 years now um, and was started by Dave Dutoy and his friend Arthur Hunt. Uh, it all started because Dave was given an orphaned baby vervet monkey who he named Regis by his one of his farm workers. Um, and the farmhand knew that Dave took care of animals and tended to them and so he brought the baby monkey to Dave, and that sort of sent Dave on this whole crazy crusade with Arthur to form this amazing place that now exists. Um, and I'm gonna do a separate video with Dave where he'll explain the whole opening, uh, the starting of the Vervet Monkey Foundation, because that story is unbelievable in and of itself, the struggles that they went through just to get this place going. The VMF is a uh, 25 hectare plot of land, which is about 61 acres, um, and it houses 14 different troops. It's home to over 550 monkeys, but that number fluctuates because we get orphans every year, old monkeys die, sick monkeys come in and they pass away, or monkeys that are injured come in and then we release them back into the wild. But we never have more than 600 monkeys because that's the law here with a rehabilitation center like our own. It's all run by staff and volunteers. Obviously there's Dave who is the founder um, and then there's Josie who is his co-director. Um, both of them work together to run everything. Josie handles more of the animal side where Dave handles the logistics of running the VMF but everything else is taken care of by staff and volunteers just like you and me. You know, it's people from all over the world who, you know, some have plenty of experience, some don't have any experience. As a volunteer, you don't need any experience. As a staff member, you're gonna go through more of a rigorous sort of uh, process of application to see if you can be a staff member here. There's also interns, but everything that happens here is run by people like you and me. And I think that's what makes it so cool. It's not just like, this, you know, really heavy sort of like you need a bunch of background. It's a place where anyone is welcome to come and anyone works and you learn on the job and you learn a lot on those jobs that you do here. What other sort of animals are at the VMF and how do we accommodate them? There are actually three Samangos here at the Vervet Monkey Foundation, uh, Charlie, Sammy, and Mango. Charlie and Sammy are both old men and Mango is I think like three or four years old at this point. Uh, he came in as an orphan and actually was with the vervets in Disneyland, which is kind of funny because now he really likes vervets and will sometimes like go over to the fence and you know hang out with his vervet friends that are in the enclosure next to him. But we primarily care for vervet monkeys. I mean, hence the name, the Vervet Monkey Foundation. Uh, we've also received bush babies in the past. Um, and rehabilitated those and then let them back into the wild here at the VMF. I actually just saw one outside my cabin the other night. He was sitting outside the window just, you know, shouting about something. Went outside, said hi to him. We get different animals. There was that episode with the baboon that came in, but we sent that one off to, I believe, Care, which is a, another um, wildlife sanctuary down the road. You know, we're willing to take care of anything. Our main focus is vervet monkeys, and we do our best to help any animal in need but then send them off to the proper place that has the proper facilities to actually care for you know, their individual needs. What are the local perceptions of the monkeys and why? 
the local perception of vervet monkeys is pretty varied, but the main perception is that people just completely misunderstand them. Uh, people will shoot them, people will snare them, people will poison them, people will use them for witchcraft, people hit them with their cars. I said witchcraft, yes. It's, it's crazy. You know, there's people who believe that these monkeys are little talking witches who will possess your dreams at night or go steal your wife um, and bring her to your neighbor. There's people who think that if you use the monkey's bones um, and grind them up and inhale them, then you can cure children of acting like monkeys. Uh, farmers blame the monkeys for raiding their crops and stealing all of their food and ruining their livelihood, which is a pretty ridiculous sort of um, accusation. But what it really comes down to, the whole reason that these monkeys are showing up in towns and causing people to get angry that they're coming into their homes or that the monkeys are, you know, in villages and people think they're witches or that the monkeys are going to farms to find food is because all of their homes, all of the monkeys' land has been destroyed for farming. It's been destroyed for building cities and villages and, you know, it's human wildlife conflict at its most prominent. It's people coming in, taking over wildlife, wild areas of nature, and then pushing these animals out of their home and then being angry when these animals come back to where their home once was and saying, hey, what are you doing here, monkey? Get out of here. You're not supposed to be here. This is my home. Stop trying to steal my food. Stop trying to steal my livelihood. And these monkeys are like, well, wait a second. You stole our livelihood. What the heck are you talking about? Like, Who's really to blame here? And so you get this huge animosity with these people who are just unwilling and unable to find sort of a balance, a happy balance, and make sacrifices. You know, you're not getting farmers who are willing to plant extra outlying crops specifically for the monkeys. You know, as a thank you. Hey, we took your land. Here's some food for you. Rather, you're getting farmers going, I'm going to shoot this monkey. I'm going to murder this monkey because this monkey is messing with my life. And it's just a very sort of one-sided, closed-minded attitude toward these animals. But I feel like that's something that happens all over the world with all sorts of different animals. You know, it's not something that's just prevalent to the vervet monkeys. It exists anywhere there is wildlife and humans trying to survive in close quarters. It's illegal to shoot a vervet without a permit, but that doesn't mean that people don't shoot them. And it's totally illegal to uh, shoot vervets, even with a pellet gun, um, in built-up areas like communities. But law enforcement here can be really poor, and that's not something that really gets paid much attention to. So some of you are asking to know a little bit more about me, um, how I got involved with the Vervet Monkey Foundation and this project. I actually first volunteered here back in 2007. I was 19, I volunteered here for about a month. Back then things were way different, you know, we lived in tents in the volunteer village, now there's nice Wendy cabins built up and everything. But yeah, I was here for a month and I was working with the monkeys and they just really blew my mind. I learned so much from them and the biggest thing that I really learned from them was about their social interactions. I really was opened up to their subtle social interactions beyond language communication uh, to the way that they would interact on a physical uh, level and how you could actually become assimilated into their troop and find where you ranked within their troop and you could see how, you know, you, you could see how they communicated and you could communicate with them and that was incredible to me and it just stuck with me and made me really want to come back and keep working with these animals and studying them and just learning more about myself and interactions between people through observation of the vervets. So back in 2015 I actually uh, decided to make a documentary and I was sort of looking for ideas of what I wanted to do and I contacted Dave and Josie and I said, hey guys, I really want to do a documentary about the vervet monkeys and, you know, the foster mother program that you guys have and everything that's going on in South Africa with the land destruction and the perception of the monkeys and how that sort of correlates on different levels. Um, 
And the whole point of that project, though, was that I wanted to kind of prove a point. I wanted to do something that was giving back to the earth, giving back to nature. Um, I feel like so many things that people do these days are for very selfish reasons, especially on social media. It's always about like the individual who's doing it. It's about trying to make a show about you or about, you know, it's just about fame. It's about fame and popularity and it's about something that's very superficial to me I and I always see that and I really wanted to make something that felt more about nature and about educating and providing something that was entertaining but also informative um and so I hope I'm doing that now but you know it was that was that was sort of the impetus for the whole thing um it was like I wanted to make something that gave back and that felt more genuine and less about myself and now it's just continuing on with this campaign that I have which is the Vervet Forest. The Vervet Forest project is bigger than just this YouTube show or bigger than the Instagram, bigger than you know any of that stuff. It is something that has been a dream of the Vervet Monkey Foundation for a very long time. And the Vervet Forest is actually an idea that is a nature reserve. It's our goal to purchase about a thousand acres of land, a little bit more than that, 500 hectares of land minimum, and to create a wildlife reserve that has all the indigenous forest that's necessary and food and water streams running through, you know, real true groundwater coming out there That is this place where nature can just thrive, where wildlife can live without any conflict with humans, and where we can begin to release our troops of monkeys that are here. We'd still remain as the Vervet Monkey Foundation here. This would be our intake, rehabilitation, and rescue center. But the Vervet Forest would become the release site. It would become the place where these monkeys can be sent out and live free. And it would take years to release all of the troops that we have here. And there's probably some troops that can't be released because the monkeys in the troops, based on their past life scenarios before arriving here, are just so humanized that they'll never make it out in the wild. They'll end up trying to get two people And that's not in their best interest. But a lot of the troops here can be released. And so it's our goal to create this forest wildlife reserve and be able to release these troops into the wild on this reserve. Now, this reserve would do so much. I mean, first of all, it would just preserve land in a country that's so quickly having its land gobbled up for farming or for houses and for people. And a place that's such lush, beautiful wildlife that has such incredible history and such variety in its ecology, it's our goal to really preserve this land. There's also the goal for the monkeys to release them there. There's also the goal to be able to help the community because when you consider a project like this, we're talking about hiring a lot of local people to work there. We're talking about being able to educate locals. And that's another big aspect of it is we want to create education centers. We want people who are kids from the villages to be able to come there, people who are kids from affluent communities to be able to come to the Vervet Forest, and everyone to be able to enjoy nature. Not at a place like a Kruger Park where you're in your car and you're just looking at animals, you know, while driving around eating your Twinkies, or not a place that's where you're going to hunt animals. It's not a game reserve. It's a nature preserve. It's a a place for wildlife to exist for people to become truly educated. So anyone who goes there would learn about wildlife. They'd learn about human wildlife conflict. They'd learn about how to help nature in their own lives. They'd learn about more sustainable methods of living. They'd learn about wellness. They'd learn about, you know, a vegan diet. They'd learn about eco-friendly housing, about reusing and minimizing your use of water. There's so many things that we want to put out into the world, into the local communities, and provide for people that this place would open up the opportunity for. So it's not just a release site, it's not just a place simply for nature, but it's an education center, it's a wellness center, it's a place that people are welcome to come, but it's not about tourism, it's about really coming there and 
creating a minimal impact, a minimal footprint on this, on this nature that you're admiring and that you're learning about. And so we need to raise a million pounds, which is, you know, somewhere like $1.2 million. Um, and that's enough to be able to create all the infrastructure that we need there to buy the land and to be able to start releasing troops and monitoring troops and hiring people for several years to come. And even being able to begin building buildings and inviting locals there to begin learning. Um, and that's our dream. That's our goal. That's the whole point of everything that I'm doing with this project is that vervet forest. And I hope that I'm explaining it well and that it comes off as lovely as I hope it to because that's just, you know, that's, that's what everything is. That's what it's all about. And that place is our dream and it's all we want to create. So if there's anyone out there who's watching this who thinks that's a great idea and wants to help, please contact us. Please, you know, let us know that you're interested. And it doesn't mean like, I don't mean just people who have money who can help us buy the land, but if you just want to volunteer from home to help with this project, to help raise awareness, please contact us at uh, thevervetforest at gmail.com and we'll talk further about it. And if you do want to contribute, if you do want to invest in this purchase of the land and this project, then also please contact us at thevervetforest at gmail.com because we need all the help we can get, and this is something that we're really striving to accomplish. What's one of my favorite memories of working with the monkeys or being here? My fondest memory would have to be when I was making the documentary, and I went away for about, I don't know, a couple of months, four, four months, five months or something, to edit the film uh, in a town away from here. And I came back to visit one day, and I was walking by the Scro Troop, uh, enclosure and the scrow troop is the troop that I focused on the orphans uh, or the, the orphans that I focused on for the film were released into scrow troop in the documentary and so I got back and I was checking out the babies in scrow troop and sort of seeing how they were doing and there was this one orphan named Scotty and Scotty was you know one of those monkeys who was just a mess she had lost her mom in a really horrific way and she was a wreck. She was crying and screaming all through her process. And I was with her so often filming. And I came back and I was walking by the enclosure and I sat down next to the intro enclosure where this new baby who I had never met was being integrated. And my friend Karen was sitting there handling the ropes. And uh, Scotty was up in a tree. And I could just see this little monkey like running toward me on the branches and she got to the edge of the branches and just stared at me and was just like looking at me and sort of tilting her head side to side and looking and I was looking at her and I was like hey is that Scotty and Karen looked over and she was like yeah I think so and Scotty was just staring at me and then she you know came down the tree and ran across the open little grassy area and came right up to the intro enclosure gate and Karen was like oh that's weird like she never really wants to come inside and play with this other baby like this is the first time she's ever done this I was like, oh, that's strange. And Scotty came right inside and Karen opened up the gate. Scotty came right inside and uh, she totally ignored the other baby. And she just came right up on top of the feeding cage. And she just sat on top of the feeding cage and got real close to me and just stared at me. And just tilted her head side to side. And she remembered me. You know, it's simple as that. She remembered me. And she came over to see me. And it was like, hey, I know you. And I was just totally amazed I was in awe by the fact that she was remembered me you know she, there I was months away and this little baby and I come back and first thing she does is run right over and go like oh hey how are you doing who can volunteer and how do you volunteer easy anyone can volunteer all you got to be is over 18 years old um, you can volunteer for a month there's sometimes you can volunteer for about two weeks but we really recommend a month because it takes a while to get acclimated. It takes a while to learn the ropes. You know, it's a big changeover. You've got a lot of work to do. So it's good to give yourself that amount of time so you can sort of get used to everything and, you know, have a lot of fun while you're here. Um, some people stay for three months. There's internships that last six months or longer. There's staff positions that last 18 months, maybe a year, three years. Um, 
there's a lot of opportunity. You don't really need any prerequisites. If you're a staff member or an intern, we look for people with a little bit more experience, but volunteers, anyone can volunteer. As long as you're able-bodied, you can walk around in the sun, you can help fill up water bowls, you know, you're okay to be here. So there's a great PDF on the Vervet Monkey Foundation website, which is vervet.co.za. Um, and or ZA for the Americans watching. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's a great PDF on that site. There's a link that says volunteer and you can find out everything from prices to information about what kind of vaccines you need to what it's like staying here, all that good stuff. And I really recommend you check it out because it's a really fun experience. And obviously my initial experience vol volunteering here is exactly what brought me back and has me doing this now. What's the weather like here? The weather here is pretty extreme at times, but pretty great at times. Right now, uh, it's our winter, so it's just gorgeous. I mean, like I'm sitting out here in short sleeves and shorts, and it's a nice sunny day. The birds are out. The sky is clear. It's awesome. The night times during the winter can get pretty, pretty cold, um, but it's great for campfires. It's great for having a nice warm bed to sleep in drinking some hot tea in the morning, you know, it's a good place. Um, summertime, which is baby season, is also the wet season, so it's rainy that time of year. Um, we've had some pretty bad droughts in South Africa. Well, I guess we're still in a drought in South Africa. It's just not rained as much as it should have and as much as it has in the past. Um, but we still get rain during the summer months. Um, that's baby season. Uh, and during that time, it can get really hot. It gets pretty humid. You know, it can be up to like 26 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius, which is like 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the summertime. That's like the average temperature. So it's always hot here during the summer. Winter, it's moderate. It's like kind of cold, it can get freezing cold at night, but you know, it doesn't snow or anything like that. And it's dry this time of year. How can people donate items to us? We've got a list of a ton of items that we can always use. Uh, and of course, there's like big ticket items that we don't have here that make our lives easier in certain situations. But if you want that list and you want to see, uh, you can send an email to info at vervet.za.org. It's kind of hard shipping stuff into South Africa because there's like big uh, customs taxes and the postal service here is awful. Things can take months or just never show up if you send it by post. It's generally easier that we find a volunteer who's coming from someplace close to where you live and you send the stuff to them and then they fly out here for their volunteer experience with the stuff that you're sending uh, in their luggage. How can people donate money? It's really easy to donate money. All you gotta do is use our PayPal, which is paypal.me slash V-E-R-V-E-T, paypal.me slash vervet. Real simple, real easy way to donate to the Vervet Monkey Foundation. And that money gets used for everything. I mean, it gets used for supplying food to the volunteers, to supplying food to the monkeys, to rebuilding enclosures, to replacing shovels that break, to helping to pay the staff members, to helping to pay the workers that are here, to helping to cover the medical expenses anytime we have to take a monkey to the vet, to cover the medicine that we have to provide to the monkeys, everything. There's so many little things that you just don't even think about that cost money and take up our resources and everything that you guys donate goes directly into that. So how does the vervet social hierarchy work? Basically, it's a matriarchy, which means that the female vervets are in charge of the whole troop hierarchy. Uh, there's one alpha female and then descending down, there's subsequent levels of, uh, I guess, social ranking for the monkeys. Um, the males are sort of outliers in that ranking system, uh, but I'll get to that. The, uh, the females, um, their babies actually adopt the rank of the mother. Even the adopted babies adopt the rank of the mother, but the male uh, baby, the male monkeys, eventually will have to fight for their ranking within the troop. Uh, rank basically dictates most actions in vervet social life, and this is the most complicated aspect of introducing mothers to the babies, because you don't want to make a high-ranked monkey mad at a lower-ranked monkey because basically like higher-ranked uh, monkeys get to you know 
eat better food, they get to eat first, they get first choices on things, um, they are rarely getting into fights unless someone's challenging them, they're manipulative and getting others to fight for them. Uh, the higher rank the monkey, the better their life really is. Um, it doesn't mean that other monkeys don't challenge them occasionally, but for the most part, life is good when you're higher ranking because you just get to do whatever you want to. But when integrating babies into the troop, you know, sometimes if you bring in the alpha female of the troop to meet the babies, you can actually throw off the balance inside the troop because suddenly the alpha female would be gone from the troop for a prolonged period of time. And if she's gone for like a month, you know, there might be a fight for dominance in the troop where a new female decides that she's going to be the alpha since the old alpha is now gone. But then when the old alpha comes back into the troop, well, then everything gets screwed up and it can cause a lot of issues. Um, you often see fights over food. Uh, like in the last episode of the Vervet Forest, we threw food out to try and get the monkeys to uh, get out of the intro enclosure when we were dealing with the uh, Nora and Shemes situation. And if you throw food too close together, instead of like in separate piles, you actually get the monkeys fighting each other over the food because then they're all sitting in the same area trying to eat. Um, and that can cause a lot of issues. So it's a pretty complicated hierarchy and it actually dictates a lot. Um, and there's a great book in the description of the, uh, uh, below the video. And in that description, there's all these links um, for books that you can buy on Amazon. Um, and one of those books is called How Monkeys See the World. And I really, 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 really recommend you read that book if you're interested in uh, vervet monkeys and their social structure and their communication and everything. There's so much just valuable information in there. Uh, it's one of those books that I read before I came out here to start doing the documentary, along with a bunch of others that are all listed in that same uh, group of uh, links in the description below. But definitely check out that How the Monkeys See the World book. It's really, really interesting. So the males in the troop rank in their own standing, like I said. They have inner troop quarrels, and they don't really have a say in the grand scheme of things. They're more the patrol on the outskirts of the troop. They make sure that the outsider males of the troop, um, or sorry, outsider males from outside the troop, like who are just coming in, migrating in to try to mate with the females, the males in the troop make sure that the uh, outsider males aren't able to come in. They're protecting their females. They generally will jump in to defend a female if she needs help and they're in a similar ranking as them, a social ranking. They also will protect babies if they're in danger. Um, they're just there as like the outliers, the protectors. When you walk around the enclosures here, you'll always see the males just on the outskirts of the troop, sort of watching everything that's going on. But what's funny is that you often see the females are the ones who do the most fighting. Uh, like when the bandits get into fights with the troops, you see the females at the front lines fighting against the bandits and the males are sort of like waiting around, like waiting for their cue to enter into the fight. But they are also the ones who will like chase other bandits and other monkeys off. And the females definitely have the say over everything that's going on. And you'll often see females shouting at the male monkeys. What is lip smacking? Lip smacking is just what it sounds like. It's a sound that the monkeys make where they smack their lips together or chatter their teeth. Um, it's sort of like a sound. Uh, it's, it's a vocalization. It's them communicating. It's saying, everything's okay. I'm going to come over. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to groom you. Just so you know, I'm approaching you with a kind demeanor and I don't mean any sort of aggression or anything negative by what I'm doing. Um, it also is a huge calming sound for the babies. Uh, if you do that to the babies, they'll just relax instantly most of the time. So it's a very important sound in the vervet culture. It can also be a submissive action. For example, if an alpha uh, female enters the area, then a lower ranking female may lip smack at the alpha female to let her know that she doesn't mean any harm and that that alpha is like clear to proceed without any sort of aggression. Um, like I said, they're very complicated in their social hierarchy and the way they communicate with each other. And it takes a lot of practice to sit there and it doesn't take a lot of practice to sit there, but it takes a lot of practice sitting there to really understand what's going on because there's just constant fluctuations and changes within their daily lives of how they're treating each other and who's friends and who's not friends and all that sort of stuff. But lip smacking is just basically this calming, soothing, submissive action that lets everyone know, hey, everything's all right. Just 
coming over to be friends with you. Don't mind me. Maybe I'm going to touch you and groom you and clean these ticks off you, but we're just being friends right now. Calm down. I hope you like it. What other forms of communication do the vervets have? There are so many forms of communication. Again, I recommend you read that book, How Monkeys See the World. Um, vervets are one of the most studied uh, primates when it comes to forms of communication. I forget how many different alarm calls they have, but there's like, they have an alarm call specifically for snakes. They have an alarm call specifically for if it's like a uh, caracal or uh, a leopard coming by. They have a different alarm call for different birds of prey. Um, you know, if it's an eagle or if it's a vulture, they have so many alarm calls. And then they have so many vocalizations that they make from like these screeching sounds to these burp, burp sounds to, you know cooing to little like weird cries and squeaks that they do there's so much and they all mean different things and honestly it would take me forever to go through what each of them means but it's worth researching and reading more into and again that book how monkeys see the world talks a lot about it and i really recommend reading that book picking that book up how do we tell the monkeys apart so all the monkeys look different um i know it's kind of hard to tell in the video sometimes the babies are really easy to tell with because the babies look drastically different and as they grow they sort of start to look more similar but basically you just get used to it. You just see their faces, you see their little quirks and their differences in colorations and sizes and their ears or their tails or any sorts of things and you just you just pick it up, you get used to it and you recognize them. You know it's the same way you recognize your friends or anyone else that you see. Um, you just get accustomed to their face. With the adults, learning the adults is a little bit more difficult than learning the babies, but it's the same sort of thing. You know, you, you get used to it. You know the adult monkeys. You, uh, if they have a face that's hard to tell apart from another monkey in the troop, then you use other indicators. You can check out their fingers. Some of them have broken or missing fingers. They may have a scar on their face. They may have ears that are you know, cut up or have like little pieces hanging off or missing. They may have a weird tooth hanging out or a cleft lip or maybe their tail is short. Like in Stick's case, he's always going to be easy to recognize because he's got half of a tail. Um, yeah, so there's just little things. You just use whatever you can to your advantage to recognize them. And the more time you spend with them, the easier it is to recognize them. How many monkeys are in each troop at the VMF? Troop sizes vary from 10 monkeys to 60 monkeys. Um, it all depends on the size of the enclosure and the numbers are constantly fluctuating, mostly because of deaths of older monkeys or injuries that require us or sicknesses that require us to take the monkeys out of the troop and over to sick bay or isolate them to their own intro enclosure. Um, and there's always different arrivals coming in every year. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say, but there's 14 troops and the numbers are all over the place and always changing. What's the maximum capacity in a troop? Vervets in the wild can range anywhere from six monkeys in a troop to a hundred monkeys in a troop. But these days you don't really see troops with a hundred monkeys. These days you generally see monkeys anywhere in a troop size from like 10 to 30. Um, sometimes you see more in like really densely like um, densely wooded areas, areas where there's lots of lush vegetation where the monkeys have natural food and forage. There's not many of those troops around. There's so many places here that are just overrun by farms and people. Most of the troop sizes are pretty small, like you know closer to 20 or 30, just because simply there's not much room or food for the troops to expand. And then again, if we're talking maximum capacity of a troop here at the Vervet Monkey Foundation, uh, it all depends on the size of an enclosure. Are the troops free? Yes and no. I mean, it depends what your definition of free is, but no, they're in an enclosure. They are surrounded by electric fences. Uh, each of the troops is a certain hectare size and has an electric fence around it. Like I said before, there's a huge animosity toward all of these monkeys. So we can't just have them roaming around anywhere because they're gonna get shot. They're gonna get hurt. They're gonna end up right back needing our care. Um, so we can't just let them go off like that. If we're gonna let them out there and walking around free, we need to have a place where they can be free and free of human wildlife conflict. Another aspect is that we need to be able to care for these monkeys. It needs to be easy for us to care for these monkeys. So with them in enclosures, we can trap them more easily. We can monitor them. If one is injured or one is sick, we can 
coax them into an intro enclosure and we can assess what their needs are and then we can you know take care of them accordingly it kind of sucks that they're in these enclosures when you think about like what the best situation for them would be but at the same time you got to think where these monkeys came from i mean a lot of these were their last legs of life and the ones that we can release we do release i mean we release a ton of monkeys every year but those are the ones who come in that we rehabilitate and we know where their troops are and we know where they can go and we send them back out there also in these enclosures it's totally natural bush so the monkeys can forage within there we supply them with forage from around the property we feed them with foods that are natural to their diets um, you know it's we give them the best life possible in their situation does the vmf keep getting more crowded yes and no uh, we're not a breeding facility. We've vasectomized all of the males here at two and a half years old uh, to make sure that they can't uh, get any of the females pregnant. We also just don't have a license to be a breeding facility. That's not the point of what we're doing. We're not trying to create bigger populations here. We're just trying to provide a sanctuary and rehabilitation for these monkeys that need our help. But every year we do receive orphan babies, and it seems that every year the number of orphans we're receiving grows. This year we received, I think, 38 orphans, and that's greater than last year, greater than the year before. And all of those have to get integrated into troops, uh, so, you know, obviously the size of the troops will grow. But like I said before, there are also monkeys who pass away, and so because of those deaths, that m number of troops, uh, or sorry, the number of monkeys in the troops diminishes. So there's this sort of balance that naturally occurs um, and we just can't house more than 600 monkeys because that's the legal limit with the wildlife permits that we have. Besides the orphans we also receive uh, adult expats and injured monkeys who can't be released back into the wild because of the severity of their injuries or their psychological traumas with expats that have been a pet for say five years, ten years. It's a really 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 difficult arduous task to get them integrated into a troop because most of them don't have any idea how to be a monkey. They're so used to people that all they know is people life and integrating them back into a troop of monkeys is a long process of being there for them and letting them out and letting them back in and monitoring them and making sure they're okay and they're not getting picked on and that they're making friends and that they're allowed to eat and seeing where they rank in the social hierarchy and all that sort of stuff. So that helps to keep the place crowded too because we just have all of these monkeys between orphans, between injured monkeys who can't be released and ex-pets and all that stuff. There's always more monkeys coming here. And yeah, so the, the only thing that stops it from being more crowded is just that natural cycle of life for those monkeys that die and free up space for the other monkeys that need to be here. Do we ever release the monkeys? The answer right now is that yeah, we do release monkeys. We release monkeys that can be released. We release monkeys that are injured, that come in, say are hit by a car, but we know where the troop is because the person who hit them or who found the monkey on the side of the road saw the troop. If we can rehabilitate that monkey, we try and get them back out into the wild as soon as possible so that they can be with their family and that you know, we don't keep them here because that's not the point. We don't want monkeys here. We want monkeys back out in the wild. So if we can release a monkey, we do. These vervet monkeys, though, are highly social animals, and you can't just send them back out. You can't just open up a crate here at the foundation and say, okay, get out there. We really have to make sure that we know where the troop is because a female especially isn't just going to be able to wander into any troop. Because of that social hierarchy, you know, that's a family lineage that she's leaving and they don't leave their troops. These females stay within their troop social hierarchy for all of their lives. And that troop social hierarchy is passed down from generations. So you can't just send a monkey out there and hope that they're going to assimilate into another troop. Now, males that are over, uh, I think it's four years of age, are a different story because they're starting to roam around and they've reached sexual maturity. They are now looking for females to mate with in other troops. And so, you know, in order to stop incest from happening, they're leaving their troop and they're going to find other troops and um, starting new lives in those other troops. And they do tend to migrate. So with a male, it's, it's easier to release a male back out if you don't know uh, where its troop is, but we do want to release the male always back into an area that is where it came from. We don't want to just like 
take it from some province that's two hours away and then release it here because it's going to be totally stupefied and it probably won't survive because the landscape's probably different, the type of forage that it's used to is probably different. So there's a lot of things to be aware of when releasing these animals back into the wild and we have to release a troop altogether. It requires us to have a temporary enclosure established at a location uh, to enclose the troops in their new location where we will be releasing them and then we have to be able to monitor them in that location and it requires knowing okay this troop is this size and this size troop generally covers this sort of distance with, uh, uh, of travel because vervets tend to have this cycle of an area that they go through over a week's period of time or over the days and so you need to know how much distance this troop is going to cover and we need to make sure that wherever we're releasing them that area where they can travel is going to be safe for them there's going to be enough forage there's going to be enough food for them to eat there's going to be sources of water they're not going to end up on farms or in towns and in an area like ours it's pretty hard to just find untouched bush that's you know open to uh, vervets being able to be out there. Most of these places, vervets that we release anywhere nearby are just going to end up back in a town or back on a farm and it's going to be trouble for them instantly. Uh, we also need to make sure that like they're safe in this area, that you know see what kind of predators are here, get them used to the new environment when they're in this enclosure that's in the area. They need to see, okay, maybe there's a caracal that comes by every once in a while or maybe there's these birds of prey or maybe there's more snakes here, you know? We have to be aware of what's there so that the monkeys can be aware of what's there so that they can get used to it so that when that enclosure's fences come down, the monkeys are okay. And then we still have to keep observing them. It's no small task. It's monitoring to make sure that like, yes, they are foraging properly. Are monkeys getting sick? Are there injured ones who we need to care for still? You know, what's the whole situation? There's a lot of factors to consider. It's a whole other project. It's a whole other thing to begin releasing monkeys. We need more people. We need more infrastructure. We need more time. You know, it's like monitoring a troop for a year before you're like clear and okay with them being there without anybody watching them. And then even after that, you're still going to want to go back and keep track of the troops and see how they're doing. There's also the pre-release assessments of the land that needs to be done. Uh, surveying the area to see what sort of indigenous bush is there, what water supply, what animals already exist in the area. But the biggest thing is that we really want to release troops. That's our biggest goal. That's what we want more than anything. Um, but we need to find the appropriate land. We need to have the money. We need to have the time. And the release needs to be in the troops' best interest. It shouldn't just be a rushed thing like, oh, okay, we're just going to put you back out into the wild. No, we need to make sure that putting them back out into the wild is going to be a better, greater benefit than keeping them here where they have the safety, the comfort, and the care that they need in the moment. What time of year is baby season? Babies are generally born between November and January. That's baby season. We start receiving a lot of orphans November, end of October, early November, but we receive them for lots of months afterward. Uh, what is the gestation period of a female monkey and do they ever have twins? The gestation period is five and a half months and yes, they have had twins, but it's very, very rare. What are the steps of the foster mother program? The first step of the foster mother program is getting the monkey in. We get, we receive an orphan, we put him into quarantine in the baby cabin. In the baby cabin, they learn to drink milk from the bottle. They begin to learn to eat some solid foods if they can. We introduce them. They start to meet monkeys through uh, the windows where they see the new environment. We make sure that they're not sick, that they don't have ticks, that they don't have any broken bones or you know, concussions or anything. We just keep them isolated and we keep an eye on them and get them to start drinking from the bottle. Next, we move them over to Disneyland. Once they're in Disneyland, they probably are introduced to the other orphans that are already there. They start to make friends. They start to learn how to play. They learn their motor skills. They spend a lot of time with the caretakers still um, because at that age, they're in need of close contact. They would not be leaving their mother's side at all. So we try and keep them close, but we also encourage them to be with the other monkeys and to explore on their own uh, so that we can dehumanize them quickly. In Disneyland, we generally have a feeding cage, uh, which is a small uh, mesh cage that has two holes in the front. The holes are just big enough for the babies to crawl into. Inside the feeding cage are two holders that the milk bottles sit inside of, 
and the babies go inside and then they learn to drink from the feeding cage, uh, from the bottle inside the feeding cage, which allows them then to drink from inside the feeding cage once they're out in the troop, which is essential because the babies have to drink milk until one years old and they can't just have us hand feeding them. We don't want them to have that human contact once they're out in the troop. The moms aren't lactating, so they can't drink from their mom's teats. So they need to get a source of milk. The feeding cage is how they get their source of milk. So when they're in Disneyland, we begin introducing them to the feeding cage. They start to learn how to use it. They start to make friends. Once we see that they're getting good at the feeding cage and um, they're about like six weeks old, we send them over to the first intro enclosure with a troop where they start meeting the foster moms. Depending on their age, we'll sit with them in the intro enclosure for a while, let them get to know the adult monkeys through the fence. And then eventually we leave the enclosure and the foster moms come into the enclosure. The babies take a while to get used to the foster moms, but eventually they acclimate to that life. They stay with them day and night, sleeping on a perch inside the enclosure. We try out different moms to see which mom is going to best suit a baby. Once we find a mom that really bonds with the baby, we leave that mom in the enclosure for as long as we possibly can. And then once the baby is three months old, we allow the baby to leave the intro enclosure with the mother and go out into the troop. We wait until they're three months old because at three months, that's when the babies in the wild would begin leaving their mother's side. But in the enclosures, they are now able to go into the feeding cage because their moms are allowing them to wander away. And because they can wander away, they can get inside the feeding cage. If we let them out, earlier than three months, usually the moms would just snatch the baby up and pull them away if they tried to go inside the feeding cage, and that's no good because then the monkeys aren't getting the milk that they need. And once they're in the troop, that's basically the end of the process, you know? That's, that's the end goal. They're in the troop, they're good, we just monitor them for a couple more weeks, make sure everything's okay, and then they're in there and they're on the normal roster of the way we monitor the rest of the monkeys. So how do we choose which moms adopt the babies? We don't really choose the moms choose you know we let moms into the intro enclosures and they meet the babies and we see what works we see if the mom wants to stay in the intro enclosure we see how interested in the baby she is and we see if they're bonding and if they are we keep them in there as long as we possibly can and then that's that you know sometimes the moms get out into the troop and the babies go off with someone else but generally once a baby has a mom they stick with that mom do the foster moms foster multiple babies? Yes, as you can see in episode 28, Stick and Elliot and their foster mom uh, all went out together. And then also Mrs. Gold in D&D &D Troop uh, is fostering Jerry, Joby, and Dee Dee. So yeah, there's definitely moms that are just great foster moms uh, and they foster multiple babies. I mean, even Jesse this year fostered multiple babies So uh, in Engelkey Troop. So yeah, it, it definitely happens. Do the moms lactate when the babies suckle? No, the moms do not lactate. Uh, this is why it's so essential for the babies to learn the feeding cage. Uh, technically, it may be possible due to the stimulation if the baby suckles continuously like in other mammals, but we don't wait for that to happen. We just provide the milk for the baby so that we don't have to worry about anything because that's not something we want to have as a, a worry. Uh, are the foster moms ever past orphans? Yes. There are plenty of foster moms who are past orphans. Buffy in Scrow Troop this year is a foster mom, is her first year being a foster mom, and she was a past orphan. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of monkeys here who are fostered, and there's a lot of them who have grown up to now be foster moms. This question is, do the moms ever leave their babies? Do the babies ever leave their moms? Are uh, the babies ever stolen by other moms? Yes and no. Uh, you'll find occasionally that a mom takes a baby out into the troop and then another female wants to take that baby. Sometimes they just share babies. You know, sometimes a baby just ends up on their own hanging out with the juveniles because that baby's at an age where it makes more sense for them to be with the juveniles rather than like clinging to a mom. So you also get high ranking females who start fights and try to take a baby. Uh, there's also tight family groups within the troop and you find that it's hard to discern a single mother because of those little family groups swapping a baby around you'll get like two moms that are of similar age and the same rank that are in the family group together and they both just trade off on that baby so you don't really know like if a baby belongs to one of them or not it's not really that sort of situation and then we also have babysitters you know we have monkeys who act as babysitters who just come by take the baby off the mom's hand for a while and take it around show it troop life and then bring it back to the mom later on 
So it's it's a varied it's a varied situation. How do the males feel about the babies? They're kind of indifferent to the babies. I mean, they in the wild they would not know whose baby or which baby belonged to which male. So there's not really like any fuss about it. They don't cause much trouble. They will protect the babies uh, if the moms need them to. They'll definitely come to the mom's side, especially if like an outsider male is coming in and trying to be aggressive toward the babies. Um, but the babies are usually scared of the large males, and so we don't ever let the males into the intro enclosures when we're integrating the babies. Um, and you'll see the babies staying away from the males once they're out in the troop too. They get kind of frightened by them. But the males don't really cause trouble. It's not until like the juvenile years that the males start interacting, and you'll see them playing with the juveniles and grooming the juveniles and stuff like that. But also the females will sometimes be seen fighting off males who... Uh, are being overly aggressive toward a baby. You'll just see like this one male running away and these like four females just chasing right after him. It's a pretty funny sight. How do the moms and juveniles feel about the babies? Moms and especially juveniles love the babies. Uh, juveniles love to be babysitters. They love to come in and play in the intro enclosures once the babies are out in the troop. The juveniles in those family groups just accept those babies as their little brothers and sisters and have a ton of fun showing them the ropes and just, you know, getting to play with someone smaller than them. It's a great time. Do the babies bond with the caretakers? Yeah, especially the older babies, the ex-pets, those ones are really attached to the caretakers. The younger ones are easier to wean away from us, but the older ones take more time. Uh, but it's our goal to dehumanize the monkeys as much as possible, so we don't really try and keep them you know, attached to us. We try and get them out of there. You know, it's been shown through our foster mom program that if an orphan is hand raised, then put with a monkey mom, the babies have an inherent fear of their human carers, even after a few days um, of being with their moms. And they'll copy their mom's responses to humans, which works out really well for the rehabilitation. And you see that in the intro enclosures. I mean, the first day we put a monkey in with a new mom in an intro enclosure, that baby may be screaming on the fence for the people, but then you go back like a week or two later and you try and approach the fence and that baby will run right into its mom's arms and the mom will grab the baby and they'll both be looking at you eyebrowing and you know, being very aggressive and stuff. So there's definitely a fear and a, a, a great sort of dehumanization that occurs very quickly with them. How do we choose the troops for the babies? Troop choices are based on the size of the troop, the number of males and females in the troop the temperament of the troop and the personality of the troop if it's a good fit for a particular orphan and if we need to put more monkeys in there, if they can get more monkeys, if they're not really right troop for getting more monkeys, it's just dependent on a lot of factors and all those factors are constantly in flux. How do we choose the names for the babies? We don't choose the names. Uh, people name the babies. So anyone can name a baby. You can name a baby if you want to. Uh, basically, during baby season, we create a list and you can get your name put on that list. It costs, I think, like $80 to name a baby, um, which is like a thousand rand. Uh, but basically, you put your name on the list. When your name comes up, we let you know if it's a boy or a girl that's arrived, and then you get to name the baby, whatever you want to name it. There is some uh, vetting that happens. Like, we try not to use names that we have for other monkeys here because then it becomes difficult for us when we're caring for them. But um, yeah, the more creative the name, the more fun it is. And it's a great way to donate here and get something out of it for yourself uh, when baby season comes around. So keep an eye out for that because I'll definitely be making announcements for that, especially on the Instagram. I always announce right away when a new baby comes in and if it needs a name. So you should follow the Instagram if you're interested in naming a baby and that's at vervet underscore forest. How old are the babies when they stop drinking milk and when do they wean from the moms? The babies begin to venture away from the moms at three months old and they stop drinking milk at around a year old. But the babies uh, truly begin to wean away at about a year uh, because they don't need that constant supply of milk and they're getting more independent. But at that point in time, they're still staying within their family structures. Unless they're male monkeys, then when they're male monkeys, they're becoming more independent, more independent. And then once they hit that point of sexual maturity, then they tend to leave the troop entirely and go venture off to find a new new family. Why do the babies suck their fingers? Does it ever stop? Why don't we give them pacifiers or things? It is a unnatural thing for them to do and it occurs in times of stress because they don't have a teat to suckle on. The mother's teat isn't just about nutrition, it's also about um, getting, what's it called, uh, a comfort. It's, it's just something that calms them down and so in the wild they don't worry about that but when they become orphans they 
need that. They have that natural instinct to want to suckle on something. And so they start suckling on their hands or their fingers, which is never good, or they start suckling on their friend's ears and stuff. And it's actually pretty horrible um, because they can really do damage to the other baby's ears. They can suck their fingernails right off. Um, it sucks. <laughs> it's not something that we want to happen and we try to stop them from doing it, but they get really fussy about it when you try and stop them. Um, and when they are suckling like that, we try and supplement the bottle so that they can feed from the bottle, but generally they just have a hard time with it and it's something that eventually uh, goes away. There are monkeys that still do it, but most of those monkeys that still do it that are older have some level of psychological trauma. Um, the younger ones that we end up putting into the troop who are suckling on their hands or sucking their fingers when they're younger uh, tend to stop once they're out there and they have a mom and a teeth. We don't encourage any sort of like non, uh, any sort of unnatural supplements. Like we don't want to give them a pacifier or something else to suck on or cuddle with or anything like that because, you know, it's, it's, it's better for them to be monkeys. We want them to keep a natural life. We want them to have a beating heart and warmth of a body and things to touch and, you know, if that means they're going to suck on their own hands or their friends, it's better than sucking on something else that they're going to get attached to because it becomes very difficult to get them unattached to or to detach them from like a teat that they've been sucking on or some sort of toy that they have or some sort of blanket. I mean, you can see it with Jerry in some of the episodes with the way she tries to snuggle into the blankets. Uh, we accidentally left a blanket behind in one of the enclosures and it caused chaos for her because she was trying to hold on to the blanket more than she was trying to hold on to a foster mom. So... We try and keep things as natural as possible in that sense. It's just better for them. Also, when the babies suckle on things that aren't natural like that, that are like a, a, a fake a pacifier or something, they actually start to produce um, stomach acid occasionally. And if they're doing that continuously and we're promoting that type of behavior, then it can cause ulcers in their stomach because their stomachs are thinking, oh, hey, there's going to be food coming soon. I need to produce stomach acid since I'm suckling, but that's not the case. And then they just have this leftover stomach acid and they get ulcers. Not something that we want to encourage. So we don't encourage suckling like that. We try and keep it as natural as possible. And 99% of the time, it's something that goes away once the babies get a mom. So if a baby gets sick, how do we catch it? That is an easier explanation than it is a thing to put into practice. The simple answer is that we try to coax the baby, probably with its mom, into an intro enclosure. And then we try and catch that baby in the intro enclosure, either with our hands or inside of a crush cage. Depends on the age of the baby, depends on how long they've been out in the troop for. Doing that sounds way easier than it actually is because every monkey is different. Most monkeys don't want to come into an intro enclosure unless they have to. You have to understand the monkey's personality. It's a lot of time of just sitting there. Sometimes you have to hide with the, in the bushes with the ropes waiting for the monkey to come toward the gate. It's about trying to lure them to the enclosure with food. It's trying to lure them in with their favorite foods. You have to know what their favorite foods are. You have to know what scares them. You have to know which monkeys they don't like being around and which ones they do like being around so that you don't mess it up. You can use other monkeys to try and get them inside. You don't want to have the wrong monkey inside so that they stay away. There's all sorts of factors involved, but basically it's just about getting them into an intro enclosure so that we can assess the situation and then we take it from there. If things are really dire, then we take them down to our sick bay area, which is, as the name sounds, it's our sick bay. It's where all monkeys go when they're in need of medical attention. Um, and that allows us to keep a constant eye on them, to provide them with warmth, hot water bottles, heat lamps, food all the time, and you know, in isolation so that they can recover and not have the strain or stress of being around the other monkeys. Um, and then once they're better, we take them out of sick bay, we send them back to the troop, and all is well. So that was a lot of questions. Uh, I hope I answered them sufficiently. I don't even remember a lot of what I was just saying. That was a whole lot of stuff. But uh, I hope you enjoyed that and thank you for watching. And remember to check out all of the links in the description below because there's a ton of great stuff down there to learn more about this show and about volunteering and about monkeys and all that stuff. Um, also check out the Instagram at vervet underscore forest. Remember to email us at uh, thevervetforest at gmail.com if you want to learn more about how you can help with the Vervet Forest project. And then 
uh, if you want to donate to the Vervet Monkey Foundation, our PayPal is paypal.me slash V-E-R-V-E-T. Thank you for watching, and uh, I'll see you on Monday with a brand new episode of The Bandit Diaries.